Hello and welcome everyone to our latest journal review on inhaled amikacin to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia, recently published on NEJM. The research problem, ventilator-associated pneumonia, or VAP, is a significant concern in intensive care units, ICUs, globally. It is the most frequent lower respiratory tract infection in hospitalized patients, particularly affecting those undergoing invasive mechanical ventilation. The incidence of VAP varies widely, ranging from 2 to 30 episodes per 1,000 days of mechanical ventilation, impacting 5 to 40 percent of intubated, critically ill patients. VAP arises mainly due to microaspirations around the tracheal tube cuff and the formation of biofilm, leading to bacterial spread in the tracheobronchial tree. This condition is associated with high attributable mortality, up to 13 percent, increased antibiotic use, prolonged mechanical ventilation and ICU stays, and elevated costs. Despite extensive research and preventive measures, the incidence of VAP remains high. Previous research has identified a potential therapeutic window to prevent the progression of VAP, which typically peaks after seven days of ventilation. Various preventive strategies, such as reduced sedation, weaning protocols, patient positioning, tracheal tube cuff management, and oral care, have been implemented but have not sufficiently reduced the burden of VAP. A meta-analysis of six trials, although limited by small sample sizes, suggested the efficacy of inhaled antibiotics in preventing VAP. Justification for undertaking the trial. Rationale for preemptive inhaled amikacin. Optimal timing. Targeting patients after three days of invasive mechanical breathing matches the higher VAP rate. This technique prioritizes high-risk patients and avoids short ventilation people. High drug concentrations. Pharmacokinetic findings predict high pulmonary secretion antibiotic concentrations, which may kill less sensitive bacteria without generating resistance. Proper targeting. Nebulization improves installation by delivering homogeneously to the tracheal tube and tracheobronchial tree. It targets the tracheal tube biofilm, which conventional preventive medicines cannot. Pathologic process intervention. Inhaled administration might be best for treating tracheobronchial colonization to pneumonia because it preserves gut flora later in the infection process. Hypothesis. It was hypothesized that a three-day course of inhaled amikacin, initiated after the third day of invasive mechanical ventilation, might reduce the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. The methodology. Type. A multi-center, double-blind, randomized, controlled superiority trial. Location and oversight. Conducted in 19 ICUs in France, the trial was overseen by the Regional University Hospital Center of Tours, with funding from the French Ministry of Health. Patient eligibility. Adult patients who had undergone invasive mechanical ventilation for at least 72 hours were eligible, excluding those ventilated for over 96 hours, with suspected, confirmed VAP, severe acute or chronic kidney issues, tracheostomy, scheduled extubation within 24 hours, or receiving systemic aminoglycoside therapy. Randomization process. Patients were assigned in a one-to-one -one ratio to receive either inhaled amikacin or a placebo. Randomization was stratified by trial center and systemic antibiotic use on the day of randomization. Allocation concealment was maintained using a centralized online server with block size determination by an independent statistician. Intervention nebulization procedure. Administered once daily for three consecutive days using a vibrating mesh nebulizer. Dosage and groups. Amikacin group. Received amikacin at a dose of 20 mg per kilogram of ideal body weight. Placebo group. Received an equivalent volume of 0.9% sodium chloride. Circumstances halting nebulization. Nebulizations were not performed if the patient was extubated, developed acute kidney injury meeting exclusion criteria, or required systemic aminoglycoside therapy. Preparation and blinding. Preparation of both trial drug and placebo was done by staff not involved in patient care or the trial. Nebulizers were obscured with opaque stickers, and serum amikacin levels were not measured to maintain blinding. Nebulizer placement positioned upstream in the inspiratory limb of the ventilator. The choice of ventilator circuits, with or without active humidification, was left to the attending physician. Ventilator settings and care guidelines, 
handled at the attending physician's discretion, with general guidance on aerosol delivery. All centers followed international guidelines for preventing ventilator-associated pneumonia. Primary outcome occurrence of a first episode of ventilator-associated pneumonia from randomization to day 28, adjudicated by a blinded committee based on international guidelines. Diagnostic standards. Standardized workup for VAP across centers, in line with international guidelines. It required requiring a positive quantitative bacterial culture in a pulmonary sample and at least two of the following findings hyperleukocytosis, leukopenia, fever, or purulent secretions with a new infiltrate on a CXR. Key secondary outcomes included incidence density of VAP, incidence of VAP due to gram-negative bacteria susceptible to amikacin, ventilator-associated events, antibiotic usage, mechanical ventilation duration, ICU and hospital stay lengths mortality rates at day 28 and 90, and nebulization safety and side effects. Statistical analysis summary. Sample size calculation. Context. Considering the competing risks of death and extubation. Incidence expectations. Expected incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP, was 6% in the amikacin group and 12% in the placebo group. Power and alpha level. To achieve 80% power with a two-sided alpha level of 0.05, the calculated sample size was 850 patients. Analysis methodology. Principle. Analyses were conducted according to the intention to treat principle. Statistical significance. Threshold set at 5%, with two-sided 95% confidence intervals for all estimates. Cumulative incidence curves used to represent the time from randomization to the first VAP episode. Survival analysis. Due to the non-fulfillment of the proportional hazards assumption, a restricted mean survival time analysis was adopted, considering death and extubation as competing events. Time to event analyses. Model used, a fine and gray regression model. Competing events. Extubation, death, ICU discharge, and hospital discharge were considered, and trial exit, withdrawal of consent, was used as a sensor, where applicable. Secondary outcomes. Analysis approach. Statistical analyses for secondary outcomes were not adjusted for multiplicity, implying exploratory interpretation. Comparison methods. Quantitative outcomes were compared using median differences. Count outcomes were compared using a quasi-Poisson regression model, with mechanical ventilation duration or ICU stay duration as offsets. Binary outcomes were analyzed using proportion differences. Subgroup analysis. Focus. Differences in restricted mean survival time to VAP in pre-specified subgroups were reported. Out of 50,605 patients admitted to 19 ICUs, 6,419 were assessed for eligibility. Reasons for non-enrollment included age, duration of intubation, lack of consent, and specific medical conditions. A total of 850 patients were randomized, with 420 assigned to receive inhaled amikacin and 430 to receive a placebo. After accounting for withdrawals and those who did not receive the full course of nebulizations, 417 in the amikacin group and 430 in the placebo group were included in the primary intention to treat analysis. Both the amikacin, 417, and placebo, 430, groups had similar average ages, around 62, and body mass indices, around 29. Gender distribution was slightly skewed towards males. Most admissions were medical, and both groups had similar comorbidity scores and severity indices. The majority of patients in each group were on invasive mechanical ventilation before randomization and received systemic antibiotics at randomization. The table summarizes an in vitro evaluation of a nebulization setup showing that amikacin delivery was more efficient in a dry circuit, 56.8% for 1 gram, 50.9% for 2 grams, compared to a humidified circuit, 47.1% for 1 gram, 46.7% for 2 grams, with nebulization times ranging from 27 to 69 minutes depending on the drug amount and circuit type. During the first nebulization in the AMIKINHAL trial, around half of the patients in both the inhaled amikacin and placebo groups were on a dry circuit or heated humidification, with most keeping the humidifier on, 
and roughly equal proportions were on volume assist control or pressure support ventilation. Ventilator settings and respiratory parameters at the onset of nebulization were similar across the amicacin and placebo groups, with minimal individual changes during nebulization. For sedation during nebulization, over half of the patients in both groups received midazolam, followed by propofol and a small percentage received dexmedetomidin, with a slight decrease in usage by the third nebulization. Paralysis was used in about 11% of patients across all nebulizations in both groups. The amicacin group had a lower incidence of the first ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP, episode by day 28 compared to the placebo, 15% versus 22%, P equals 0.004. There were fewer ventilator-associated events and infection-related complications in the amicacin group. Days with antibiotics and antibiotic days per ICU stay were slightly lower in the amicacin group. Mortality rates in ICU and hospital were similar between groups. Acute kidney injury by day 28 was less frequent in the amicacin group, 4% versus 8%, P equals 0.03. There was no significant difference in the isolation of bacteria resistant to amicacin or in the acquisition of resistant bacteria from ICU to discharge. The clinical presentation of ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP, showed that a higher percentage of patients in the placebo group had purulent tracheal secretions compared to the amicacin group. Temperature and leukocyte counts were similar between groups. Oxygenation levels and hemodynamic compromise were also comparable, with a small percentage of each group requiring new or increased vasopressor support. Microbiological documentation for the first VAP episode showed that in the inhaled amicacin group, Enterobacterellus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa were less commonly isolated compared to the placebo group. Staphylococcus aureus was the most common gram-positive cocci isolated in both groups. Antibiotic resistance patterns of isolates during the ICU stay revealed that enterobacterellas in the amicacin group were less often ceftriaxone resistant and the incidence of methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus was lower compared to the placebo group. Patients who experienced at least one episode of ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP, had a higher ICU mortality rate, 30%, compared to those without VAP, 24%, and they required longer durations of invasive mechanical ventilation and longer ICU stays. They also had more days with at least one systemic antibiotic and more systemic antibiotic days overall, indicating a higher burden of treatment and potentially more severe illness. Key Findings Efficacy of Amicacin The trial demonstrated that a three-day course of amicacin significantly reduced the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP, by day 28 compared to placebo. Safety profile. Less than 2% of patients experienced serious adverse effects. Contextual comparison. The results align with previous trials using different inhaled antibiotics but show efficacy with a shorter course of amicacin, distinct from a previous international trial using inhaled amicacin for established VAP, which didn't improve survival. Implications and limitations potential for earlier intervention. There may be merit in evaluating interventions prior to the third day of ventilation, balancing the risk of increasing antibiotic resistance. Trial limitations. Focus on VAP. The trial wasn't powered to investigate outcomes like mortality or ICU, hospital stay length. Systemic antibiotics use. Not designed to assess the impact on systemic antibiotic usage, a critical aspect in the context of antibiotic resistance. Placebo choice. The use of 0.9% sodium chloride as a placebo, while maintaining double-blind design, might be considered a limitation, but it's unlikely to have increased VAP incidence. Overall conclusion The trial suggests that a short course of inhaled amicacin can effectively reduce VAP burden in patients undergoing prolonged mechanical ventilation, with a generally favorable safety profile. However, broader patient-centered outcomes and the long-term impact on antibiotic resistance require further investigation. Our take is that it can be tried in our Indian setup in research setting with mesh nebulizers.